program. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Sentinel Hotel in downtown Portland, where thousands of people are joining us online, on the radio, and on TV. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. Our radio audience is listening via X-Ray FM stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. And TV viewers will watch today's program via open signals at community uh, media television stations. We're incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing City Club forums to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our sponsors, volunteers, and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. A special thank you goes to the Oregon Department of Transportation and Metro for sponsoring today's discussion. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who's made this event possible. <laughs> so I've been involved with my neighborhood association since 2001. Over the last 18 years, I've sometimes been frustrated at our inability to engage more of our community and I've been concerned about some of the policies and practices that I think we've been a part of. But I've always felt it was important to support our capacity to organize as neighbors. And when the city of Portland recently proposed closing Columbia Pool in our neighborhood, I became chair of the Portsmouth Neighborhood Association to try to do my part to save this treasured community resource. However, I strongly believe that local government can and should do a better job at working with and listening to broader communities than they do now. A couple of months ago, our Friday Forum Committee discussed how various agencies are updating how they do civic engagement, including the City of Portland's code change process. It was a fascinating conversation, and it led us to want to learn more. Specifically, we were interested in understanding the ideas behind the potential changes, the historical context, and examples of how other cities have done this work. Today, I'm pleased to introduce you to three people who can help us explore these questions. Joining us are Carl Abbott, Professor Emeritus at Portland State University. Carl is a specialist in the history of American cities and city planning and has written four books of, about Portland, including Greater Portland, Urban Life and Landscape in the Pacific Northwest, and Portland, Planning, Politics, and Growth in a 20th Century City. After Carl speaks, we'll hear from Kathy Nyland, the city, Assistant City Manager for the City of Tigard. Before moving to Tigard, Kathy worked for the City of Seattle, where she served in a multitude of roles, including Chief of Staff to a City Council member, Senior Policy Advisor focusing on land use, and as Director of Seattle's Department of Neighborhoods. We'll then hear from Suk Ree, Director of the Office of Community and Civic Life at the City of Portland. Before going to work for the City, Suk was the Vice President of Strategy and Community Partnerships at Northwest Health Foundation where she worked with a wide range of organizations and sectors to increase the participation and influence of communities in decisions that impact their lives. After our guests have all spoken, Caitlin Baggett Davis will lead a moderated discussion and then open the floor to questions. Thank you to everyone here uh, for being part of today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming our guests, starting with Carl. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to the City Club again. It's always fun. Um, and my job is to do a little scene setting. I am the historian in the group, so I get to do the history part. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is why community participation at all when most elected officials and many bureaucrats would actually prefer just to be left alone and do what they want to do. That is the historic pattern. Uh, although Portlanders, of course, are much better behaved, of course. Uh, but at what I call the modern era of citizen participation, it really involves federal mandates. What were controversial federal mandates in some ways still are. Um, in the War on Poverty, the Community Action Program 1964 required maximum feasible participation of the poor, the people who are being served, to the high distress of mayors and other local officials. Um, 
model, the Model Cities program a couple years later required widespread citizen participation in the Model Cities decision making in those you know, areas designated as Model Cities neighborhoods. And there are different ways in which that could be done, but in many cases there were elected Model Cities assemblies, which were important training grounds for um, minority communities you know, to, to be involved in civic life. Um, and then the uh, Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 required, if you're going to spend those, that nice federal money, required that you consult the community as you spend it. Um, and particularly the, that 64 legislation required lots of scrambling by you know, local communities, by local governments to figure out, oh my God, we have a federal, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, so that's where in a second, you know, Portland Neighborhood Associations fit in. But it's very clear, you know, just have to look at the experience of model cities in Portland. Um, bureaucrats and public officials, whether it was Portland Development Commission or the Portland School Board or the mayor, did not like having model cities people, you know, citizens start talking about systematic racism in Portland, which of course Portland didn't have. Um, so that, you know, I've read plenty of the, the documents in that time, the kind of the, the anguished annoyance that people could say these kind of things about well-meaning old white guys, um, or maybe not so well-meaning. So, um, so the origins of the Office of Neighborhood Associations in Portland, um, the neighborhood, what I call the neighborhood revolt in Portland, was a revolt against the real estate transportation growth machine um, and against the downtown establishment. It was driven by resistance to freeway projects, the famous misnamed Mount Hood Freeway, which of course was not going to go to Mount Hood, um, never would have and doesn't today, and would have taken out, as you probably know, swath of, of land between sort of Division and Clinton through Southeast the hippest part of Portland today would have been, how would we be a cool place if we'd wiped out Clinton Street? That's what I want to know. Um, so there are grassroots organizations in every part of the city. Model Cities program in North and Northeast, the Northwest District Association, which was organized to resist industrial area expansion into residential blocks, Southeast Uplift, which was sort of the southeast equivalent of the Model Cities program uh, organized by the city, played a key role in blocking the Mount Hood Freeway. Um, the North Portland Citizens League, um, you know, the, the neglect of the North Portland Peninsula, um, St. John's and Portsmouth, that, those neighborhoods that kind of are off the radar for most people. Um, the Lair Hill Association, again, fighting urban renewal of that historic neighborhood. Um, and these, the, this grassroots activity bubbling up in the late 19, you know, 60s, the very beginning of the 1970s, is recognized by some political leaders as a real political force, by Lloyd Anderson, at that time a city commissioner, and by Neil Goldschmidt, uh, who saw this, you know, saw a way of helping to mobilize this kind of activism for uh, progressive causes at the same time, you know, regularize it. So they established the, the Office of Neighborhood Associations, a pretty unique organization that basically gave city recognition to neighborhood associations as long as they did certain basic good things like open meetings and, you know, take, you know, keeping minutes, etc. and provided some, some city funds to help them do their very basic work. Um, it's far more radical than what most cities did in the same time period. Um, I think of it as having funded a loyal opposition, you know, sort of funding uh, voices to offer alternative views. Um, again, there are a few cities, Satan, Ohio, had elected priority, neighborhood priority boards, for example, which had some similarities of being semi-independent. So, um, 
Portland neighborhood activism was a seedbed for progressive politics and politicians. Here are the three examples who, go, who went directly into you know, city government, into the city council. Um, Charles Jordan, uh, Margaret Strawn, Bud Clark, um, all voices, people whose influence has resonated and remained with in Portland today. Um, Vera Katz also got her um, kind of political start in the Northwest District Association. I didn't include her because she made a detour to Salem before she came back to Portland. But you know, Vera Katz could be in this, you know, added here. Amanda Fritz is another city council person who was, has been active in, at the neighborhood association level. Um, uh, county commission, you know, people have served on the county commission like Diane Lynn have been involved in the neighborhood association system. So um, again, a seedbed for progressive voices becoming involved in, in city politics. And I think in particular, the, um, in the 1970s, 80s, you know, uh, neighborhood associations are very clearly seen as partners with city, with city government. A uh, system of neighborhood needs reports uh, were one way in which neighborhoods could feed their ideas into the city. So just to wrap up, um, since the 1980s, there's been you know, a gradual transformation. Neighborhood associations became the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, became the Office of Community and Civic Life, uh, broadening. Uh, at the same time, more and more you know, activities and functions got layered onto that office. So it does, you know, a lot of stuff was given to it um, because it could very efficient at outreach, or if you were cynical, to kind of smother it under a little layer of extra things to do. So I leave that thought with you to trigger debate amongst the rest of us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. So my name is Kathy Nyland, and I am here because of my previous life at the City of Seattle, specifically with my time at the Department of Neighborhoods. We were the department that was in charge of outreach and engagement. And I'm here to talk to you about the always changing landscape of outreach and engagement. In my experience, engagement is often the afterthought. I'm here to tell you that it should be the thought first and foremost. I'm talking about working to make communities feel seen, heard, and remembered. Those principles guided my work, and that was the focus in Seattle, and it did work. To truly understand this journey, we need to understand where we started. Until a few years ago, I think that's the second one. Um, until a few years ago, the city of Seattle and the Department of Neighborhoods operated under a system that was created over 30 years ago by resolution 27709. This resolution created what we refer to as the district council system. These district councils were the designated groups that the city reached out to for engagement purposes. It was innovative for its time, but a lot has changed since then. So what has changed over the last 30 years? Judging from the picture that they had, my gray hair has changed. Um, how we communicate, how we share information, how we interact. We have Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn to name a few. All of these platforms that I signed up for and I don't have an idea what my password is anymore. So what did not change over the 30 years? The way Seattle did outreach and engagement. In my first year at the Department of Neighborhoods, I observed and assessed. I looked at our lines of business, and I learned about who we were engaging, which was important. But this also showed me who we weren't engaging, which was equally important. It quickly became apparent that we were still operating under the same structure from the 80s. And I love the 80s. So we had the same district councils, and in some instances, the same members. We were operating under a system that worked for some, but not for all. 
I like to say that if you were looking for the pulse of an older, middle to upper class Caucasian homeowner, we were the place to go. I do not say this lightly because I am an older, middle class Caucasian homeowner and former chair of one of these councils. I will acknowledge and understand we are an important voice, but we are not the only voice. We could do better. We needed to do better. So we started by stating that barriers exist that prevent people from participating. By saying that out loud, by saying that barriers exist, we gave ourselves permission to question our institutional structures and started to create a more inclusive system for participation. We knew that not everyone could attend a community meeting on a weeknight. We knew that not everyone could come down to city council in the afternoon to provide testimony. We knew these structures, while well intended, actually prevented many people from participating. Information is power. Access is the key to being informed. So if we wanted to expand who was at the table, we had to broaden access and create more opportunities. And that's exactly what we did. In 2016, an executive order was issued directing the Department of Neighborhoods to apply an equity lens to how we did outreach and engagement, adding the gravitas that we needed to make real changes. This executive order asked that Department of Neighborhoods work with all of our departments on their outreach efforts. It allowed us to reallocate our services differently, our resources differently, including staff time. It allowed us to do things differently, more equitably. Not everyone shared this opinion or perspective. Not everyone believed there was a problem and not everyone wanted to see change. A firestorm ensued. Equitable outreach. You'd think this was a dull moment, but firestorm. Who knew equity was controversial? <laughs> Me, I did, I learned quickly. Um, Change is hard, but not changing would be even more difficult. We believe that successfully engaging community in city processes increases the likelihood of public support and delivers better outcomes for all of those involved. We kept our old formats and we tried new ones. Some succeeded and some did not, but we kept trying. We tested new venues breweries and soccer pitches. We held pop-ups on sidewalks. We took over parking spaces to have conversations. We tried virtual reality, we hosted trivia nights, we utilized videos, and we partnered with nonprofits. And with each effort, we started to see more faces. We heard from more voices. We changed how the city meets with community. We served the underserved, and we brought chairs to the table so more people had a seat we provided access to information. And how did we know this approach was working? Because we had meetings where 250 people would attend, where seven or eight languages were interpreted in real time, where renters were in the room. That's right, renters were in the room. We had meetings where 40% of the attendees had never interacted with the city before. Outreach and engagement is hard work, and it's important, and it's needed, and it is always changing. What works today might not work tomorrow. It can feel overwhelming and sometimes deflating. And then you get this. An introduction slide. <laughs> There's a slide. Well, you get thank you notes. Who gets thank you notes after a public meeting? We did. I'm standing here before you to let you know it can be done. Equitable outreach and engagement is possible. Here are some of the lessons learned along the way. Things that I found myself saying almost daily, the Kathy quotes, if you will. Things that may help you navigate a new way, a more inclusive way. They are, we are trying new approaches. Not trying is our only failure. We are telling people they have a voice but they are not the only voice. We don't believe there's one representative group. We are not accepting, but we've always done it this way. We are reminding people that engagement needs to be engaging and that the messenger is just as important as the message. If we are doing outreach and engagement well, it feels like we are not doing things to communities, but rather for and with them. 
Outreach and engagement is like an onion. There should be many layers, and yes, sometimes it will make you cry. <laughs> Lastly, everyone has a voice, and it's our job to hear those voices. So I leave you with this. Put people first. Share the power and be willing to share the power. This is not about excluding, but rather including more people. Turn obstacles into opportunities. So thank you for listening, and thank you for your willingness to listen to more communities. I'm Kathy Nyland. Is this good enough? Good afternoon. I'm Sook Ree, and I have the honor of serving as the director for the Office of Community and Civic Life for the City of Portland. Today's conversation is so important because all of us here in this historical moment are shaping the future of our city. The choices we make every day are shaped by our past, and they do bend the arc of the future. One way we do this is through civic engagement. That is the, this is the mission of civic life, to promote a culture of civic engagement by connecting and supporting all Portlanders, working together and with government to build inclusive, safe, and livable neighborhoods and communities. The mission sounds very agreeable, but every word of the mission is contested on a daily basis. Take the word all, for example. Um, are you a Portlander if you do not have an address because you're unhoused or have been pushed out? Or take the word safe. What does safe mean if you are a young man of color, or an elder who does not speak English, or a parent of very young children, or an able-bodied homeowner who has most of their basic needs met? Last July, City Council directed the office to review its code and make recommendations for more inclusive practices. The Bureau has done many amazing things over 45 years and often led by the volunteer leaders of neighborhood associations, community groups, youth commission, and more. And at the same time, the Bureau has received criticism and calls for change for several decades. The title of the 2016 audit of the Bureau laid it out pretty clearly quote, community and neighborhood involvement, accountability limited, rules and funding model outdated. And even when the Bureau was not the focus of inquiry, it was often a subject of criticism. In the City Club's recent research report on Portland's form of government, it says that, quote, in unsolicited comments, our witnesses heaped enormous unprompted criticism on ONI, to, to a degree suggesting it would be useful to examine whether the office is delivering appreciable value to Portland residents. To Portland residents. Thank you, City Club. <laughs> uh, our, our, our accomplishments, our mission, and the criticism that we earned compels us to have a bigger conversation about democracy in updating the code. In 2019, our duty and opportunity is to have a conversation about government's role in being accountable to all Portlanders in supporting their civic engagement. So the conversation is less about a type of group or a specific model of engagement, but more so about building upon the past to create a vision for an equitable future. Since last November, we've been reaching out to Portlanders to have this conversation in a variety of ways. Online surveys, community meetings in five languages, and outreach to new audiences uh, for the Bureau, such as groups in the faith, native, business, and unhoused communities. The first people we did reach out to were in our database, and they were those who were already connected to us, neighborhood associations, coalitions, and our program partners. It took extra effort and different methods to reach groups beyond this network because we had not previously invested in those relationships. The first question we asked was, how do you define civic engagement? And we asked for words and images, and the responses covered the entire spectrum. The next two slides are some of the images that we received. So, but what you see depends on where you stand. And we saw that responses reflected people's experience of Portland. And to respect multiple truths, we refer to civic engagement as all the ways by which we participate in this democracy. So we need to talk a little bit about democracy. I've been thinking about the question, where does democracy happen? Last month, Stonewall activist George Chauncey was interviewed about the 50th anniversary of the uprising. He said, it is curious that the iconic moment for the gay liberation movement happened at a bar. It wasn't a ballot box. It wasn't a hiring hall. 
That's because bars were where gay people experienced their policing and their second-class citizenship most directly. So, democ so democracy takes place everywhere. And if who you are is not valued by society, then you are subject to policing and second-class status, even in those places where you feel most yourself. That is, and that is a true statement for many groups. I think about our mixed-status families who are experiencing this heightened reality today. So for some of us, being our inalienable self in public spaces is a type of civic engagement that is not a choice. Next photo, please. So it's more photos and then the next one. In Portland, the LGBTQ movement, rights movement also looked like this. This beautiful group are members of the Black Gays and Lesbians United in, in the 1980s. They, or, according to these members, they organized this group because one, they saw white lesbians and gay men fighting, unable to work together, and they wanted to model men and women working together. And two, they needed space to be African-American people without the strain of racism or of being regarded as the other, which they found in the larger movement. This reminds us that there is no one size fits all for communities. And when groups self-identify and they claim their rightful place in the public imagination, then we all gain a better understanding of who we are and how we relate. And that is a powerful act of civic engagement. Another place where democracy is happening is in our no, that's okay. Uh, another place where democracy is happening is, our, is in our children's classrooms. Whenever they practice active shooter drills or when they fight climate change or organize for a better education. We have put our children on the front lines of our political impasse in these areas. Let's go back to the kids. So uh, when we get back to the image of the kids raising their hands, you see it's an image of students and their legislative champions who led the fight for the passage of House Bill 2845, which requires Oregon to adopt ethnic study standards for K-12 schools statewide. These youth leaders, thank you, demanded that all our histories be told and honored. Communities compelling government, and in this case, public schools, to be relevant to all its members is another critical act, and I would say a necessary condition for civic engagement. So in these examples, we see that democracy is fundamentally about the relationship between communities and their government. Simply who we are has long been an affront to, to democracy, as well as an engine for democracy. And that is because democracy in the United States has its origins in colonization and white supremacy and economic exploitation, as well as native sovereignty and the striving for self-determination. In 1787, now I'm the historian, Carl. In 1787, the Constitution enshrined noble ideals, but not for everyone. 81 years later, we extended equal protection and due process to most everyone, citizens, um, with, with the 14th Amendment. And 180 years later, we passed civil rights, voting rights, fair housing, and other protections to make it a little bit more real. 232 years later, right now, many people listening to this conversation have race-based covenants and restrictions in the deeds to their homes. These restrictions are again selling to, quote, persons of any race other than those of the Caucasian white race or even occupying the same as residents. So it is a work in progress, and that is why we're updating the code, because we are not done, we're not even close. In the updates to the code, we are applying what we have learned since 1787 and 1974. First, we are focusing accountability on government's responsibility to be relevant and to respect all communities as an essential condition for supporting their civic engagement. Second, we are building upon our existing commitments as a city to become a racially and socially just Portland. We've already decided that many times over in our, in our city's history. A measure of our success should be the equitable outcomes we deliver through civic engagement and not just processes for process sake. And to achieve better outcomes, we must work at the intersections. Outcomes are predictably worse for certain groups due to the compounding effects of multiple systems. So if we work at the intersections of many areas of concern, we will find new partners and shared solutions. And again, that means asking, what do we want to achieve together, rather than, what type of group are you? Fourth, we are engaging the future. This generation, the ones in kindergarten today, our children, um, are the most diverse in our country's history. 
and we also have many wise elders among us, and what a blessing that is. So we must think and we must act intergenerationally. And fifth, we must name all Portlanders as the group served by government and by civic life, however they come. When communities have not been named in code or policy or law, or only when some groups have been named, this has had devastating impacts for being represented, served, resourced, and valued in this country. We have a moral and legal obligation to remedy this in the next iteration of code. Thank you. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Caitlin Baggett Davis, Executive Director of the North Star Civic Foundation. I'm here today with Carl Abbott, Professor Emeritus at Portland State University, Kathy Nyland, Assistant Manager at City of Tigard, and Suk Ri, the Director of Portland's Office of Community and Civic Life. Thank you all three for your comments. A really helpful way to start this conversation, which I think on stage will be relatively short before we open it up for audience questions. Our City Club Program Committee intended that this program be focused on illuminating and exploring the proposal developed by Director Rhee and her team, not a debate. Because there are other venues for that kind of conversation, and because City Club is exploring how to counterbalance an increasingly polarized and reductive tone in our civic life. But that's not to say that there are no tensions in our community about this proposal. Kathy, I want to start with you. In 2007, 2018, Seattle writer Erica Barnett wrote that your work, quote, met with staunch resistance from both inside and outside the Department of Neighborhoods, including traditional neighborhood activists who viewed input as a zero-sum game. Zero-sum game is an interesting quandary in public life. Did reforms in Seattle diminish the access, engagement, or power for neighborhood activists? No. <laughs> Thank you for that succinct answer. Oh, Erica Barnett, you still linger. Um, we heard that a lot. We heard that the zero-sum game, we heard um, going backwards, we, we heard everything. Um, and the simple answer is no. We did not, um, through the executive order and the actions that we took, we didn't take anyone's power away. People who, still, who had access still have access. Um, what we did was, um, as I mentioned, we brought more chairs to the table. We offered more ways to engage. We held those traditional community meetings, um, but we did other things on top of that. We did a lot of like online town halls because not everyone can come downtown at six o'clock. Um, when I, before I worked for the city, I was often, you know, interacting at two in the morning, sending emails. So it was just thinking more broadly about offering ways for people to participate if they so chose. But my simple answer was no. People who had power still had that power. We just wanted to share it. Sook, thank you for offering a visionary opening about the direction in your proposal. Can you explain in some more detail the timeline and process for your uh, proposals and code change? What's being decided? When? What input are you seeking? I was going to joke and when you said, can you explain, I was going to do Kathy, no, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the timeline and process. Well, actually, I referred to it in my comments, or I hope I did, that we started this process last November um, in, uh, with the, in, in, with the, with the, um, composition and the invitation to the committee 3.96. So there is a committee of Portlanders that will represent a cross section. Uh, and then we started initial outreach and uh, we actually started with an online survey to the communities that we already knew and we in ways that we are already reaching them. So, um, but the online surveys results showed that we were only reaching the networks that we currently had. And so we actually started modifying and adapting and reaching out to new audiences. Again, in, uh, as Kathy 
be said in ways that they want to be reached in their languages and at the time of their choosing. And so we have a mixed approach to getting the feedback that we need. And honestly, it's not about how many, we know we are not going to reach 650,000 um, Portlanders directly, but we do need an important cross section. And so at this point now, the code co uh, conversation um, is reaching more audiences through venues like this, and there's opportunities to provide feedback uh, at this stage online when the final draft of the code is, is um, approved by the committee. Thank you. Do either of you have any questions about that timeline or process that you want to ask? No, I've, I've read online and I've, I've talked. It's an, it's, I always say um, you can have a timeline that takes months, years, but tear off the Band-Aid because it's long overdue. Change makes people anxious and sometimes makes us more conservative than our values would otherwise direct us to be. And our region is facing a lot of change. We have some really big issues to navigate together. Our region has doubled in population in the last generation and is poised to add another million to the region. Climate change and a generation of forced migration will change the way that we live in this area. How do each of you think about how Portland's structures for civic engagement prepare us to navigate our future housing, planning, transit, and safety decisions collaboratively? Well, there are currently, as we know, discussions underway about changing the structure of Portland city government, um, on which the city club has weighed in. Um, and whether this, you know, those conversations are an important way of thinking about this. Um, you, know, you, know, you know, civic life is, as Sook is saying, Kathy, a very broad concept that ranges from uh, simple participation in local community activities through participation in electoral politics. And um, I think it's really important, it has been for a long time, that the city continue to develop structures that allows anybody who wants to to run for city office, which basically means structures for um, public funding, you know, you know, campaign limitations and public funding of campaigns. Um, this is, you know, at the, I don't want to call it the top end, but the kind of the very public end of electoral politics that's the way to get more voices heard, uh, to get more participation. Um, and beyond that, I, mean, I think every, everything that both Kathy and Sook have said about different ways of outreach, is one of the things that I've you know, observed in you know, teaching, helping to teach uh, you know, you know, city planning students at PSU over the last you know, decades is how much more creative the students have gotten about how they get community input into their projects. So um, talk to our graduates and hire them. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> Kathy. Um, I've been in Oregon all of nine weeks, so I'm not an expert yet. Give me another few. But I can talk about my, um, uh, it's very similar in Seattle. So I lived in Seattle for 20 years. Um, it went from a big town to a city that was like on CNN almost nightly. So we made that leap very, very quickly. And by very quickly, that means years and years and years, but that's very quickly. So I understand um, that that, that um, nervousness of, of change. Like in our downtown, there were 68 cranes um, that dotted the skyline. And it was overwhelming, even for someone who wasn't born and raised there. There was a lot going on. And um, it was just kind of a frenetic energy. So people want to be able to control something. So like having that projected onto how we did outreach and engagement, I understood that energy and, and where it was coming from. And um, change is hard. That's, um, no one is going to deny that. It's easier for some people, but um, it's happening. And we really focused on shaping that change and seeing how we could offer services that really aligned with people who are now calling Seattle home. 
I'm going to speak to the part, the last part of your question about how do our civic structures respond to growth and transportation and housing. And I think it's, um, it does require a reimagination and a reinvestment. But when we think about things that we really care about, there are already people and structures doing that work. So in terms of growing populations and if this still is a city for working families in education, we have schools and school districts and we have a lot of infrastructure around schools. So we need to reimagine how we can work with uh, child serving and, and parent serving um, entities. When we think about resiliency, there are ways that we could think about uh, fire management areas as a way to conceive of geographically based responses as well as school districts in my earlier example. When we think about work and transit, uh, the Portland Comprehensive Plan talks about centers and corridors. So there are lots of place-based, geographically based, issue-based, people-based ways. What are the things that people care about? And we know in this society uh, that there are people, whatever people care about, they are there. We just need to find them. And I think our task is not to invent new structures, but to link existing structures and ask people to, again, work at the intersections. So I want to ask you a question about the census. This year, to, to my understanding, for the first time in Portland history, your bureau made a very significant request of the city of Portland for funding to achieve a full count for the census. Can you illuminate why that is part of your mission? And is that a concrete example of the changes in leadership that we should expect from your bureau? So I'm going to try to restrain my anger about the census and today's and this week's headlines and just appropriately answer your question. So uh, fundamentally, we talk about the conditions necessary for government to ensure for people's civic engagement. Fundamentally, the right to be counted, to say I am here, I belong, and I count, that is the first act of civic engagement. And so uh, if we have um, I don't believe that we've ignored that or disregarded that, but I do, don't see the evidence of where we've invested along those lines in the last four or five decades in the history of the Office of Community and Civic Life. It's not just this, uh, it, so that is an indication, is, is we need to get back to some fundamentals about, and thank you, Kathy, for giving us that language, keep people first people first, right? And then um, also it's been a, a, um, a really wonderful opportunity to work with the county, county's leadership, and now the state's leadership. Uh, the county has also stepped up in a tremendous way. The Tri-County Complete Count Committee is working together in a way they did not do so in 2010. I wasn't here in, in 2000. And then the state just made a seven and a half million dollar investment um, in the Complete Count for Hard to Count communities that we did not see in 2010. And that is because we know in 2019 how much it matters. It's about power and money, but more fundamentally, it's about a conversation of who we are and who we're going to be as a country. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Caitlin Baggett Davis. I'm here today with Carl Abbott, Professor Emeritus at Portland State University, Kathy Nyland, Assistant Manager at the City of Tigard, and Sukri, the Director of Portland's Office of Community and Civic Life. We're going now to the audience for questions. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for City Club staff to collect. You may also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. To City Club members who would like to ask a question at the mic, please identify yourself as a member and ask one single question in 30 seconds or less. I know it's a challenge. I know you're up for it. As people are lining up, I will ask one final question. Early in my work as an activist, a mentor observed that my meetings and agendas sometimes disempowered the people who were in them. That because as a young meeting organizer, I failed to provide clear structures, rules, and expectations that would equalize power, the loudest and most powerful members of those meetings dominated them. This was a really important lesson for me about the power of accountability and transparency and rules. And one concern that has been raised about from neighborhood associations is that standards for community organization meetings that were included in the old code have been erased. Standards to hold public meetings, to keep minutes. How do you respond to those concerns? 
So this is actually, uh, there are many parts to this answer, so I'll try to be succinct. So uh, Caitlin's asking about the requirement, requirement, not suggestion or not invitation, to comply with open meeting laws and public meeting laws. So, so I just want to say from the outset, um, anybody can use those uh, standards. So those, you can, you can conduct yourself according to public meeting laws if you so choose. What's going to be different is the requirement. So let's first remind ourselves what public meeting laws are for. They're for public governing bodies, uh, state, regional, local, uh, when they govern or decide. So neighborhood associations, uh, which are subject in the current standards, are volunteer-led groups. The Department of Justice, the District Attorney, City Attorneys have clearly stated that public meeting laws do not apply to these volunteer neighborhood associations because they are not acting in a public body or as a, as a subgroup of a local governing body. However, the City of Portland and the Bureau had decided that it was a choice, a matter of policy that we ask neighborhood associations to comply with these rules and we've been told by neighbor association leaders um, it was in the spirit of accountability and transparency but it was also because um, they did not that neighborhood associations could not be trusted. And on that last part, I do not agree. That has been stated to me, um, but I do not agree that those are the only ways that neighborhood associations could, like the rest of the community, uh, be open and transparent and accessible. So I have uh, lots of other questions uh, for uh, to, to continue that conversations that I would like to ask this group, but I, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna leave it at that. I see our first question at the mic. Leslie Johnson, City Club member. Um, I have been active over the years in my neighborhood association where I live and close in Southeast and also in the neighborhood association where I worked for a long time, Goose Hollow. Um, and I, there were a bunch of vivid lessons from those two experiences that were in pretty stark contrast, not the least of which was in Goose Hollow, the neighborhood association board and meetings were at the Mac Club and in the, close in Southeast, the neighborhood uh, association meetings are in a very old church building with uh, dowdy furniture and not very good AC in the summer or heating in the wintertime. Um, I learned only a little bit in that time frame about how uh, the city provides funding for neighborhood association and coalition activities and I wonder what assurance you could give or explanation you could give about how talk about changes to the code will assure that um, the resources that the city is making available will be equitably distributed around the city. Sorry, that's for me. So I'm going to say that uh, the code, Chapter 3.96 in City Code, that finds the functions of the Bureau, but any code is not a budget document and it's not a budget commitment. And in fact, the City Council uh, annually adopts our budget, so there are no budget or financial resource commitments uh, in any part of the code. That's just not, it's, that's not the function of the code. Um, we, I would say that uh, we need to actually, um, and I'm not going to do it in this brief response, examine what equitable investment has looked like from the Bureau in all communities over 45 years. And I think uh, if, we're, if, if that is the intention of the public to ensure that we equitably invest in all parts of Portland's and Portlanders, and the entire civic invest, uh, engagement and community engagement infrastructure, then we need to do an, examine, an examination of where we've currently been investing and, and, and start from there. Go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Peter Englander, City Club member. Uh, neighborhood associations have been where we've had both rights and responsibility with respect to land use issues. So I'm curious the vision for how uh, the committee has come up with how we do this differently and I'm curious also from Kathy how that's been addressed in Seattle, but I'm interested in the vision first. The vision around uh, the unique way that neighborhood associations have been written into code and state law around land use. Um, Land use is one of the many uh, one of many things that Portlanders care about, and so the code uh, draft language, which you could find on our website, portlandoregon.gov/civic. Um, 
doesn't speak to any one specific area like uh, transportation or land use, et cetera. It talks about the responsibilities and the functions of the Bureau ensuring that all communities can participate in those processes. And so uh, preserving the important reasons why people want to be involved in land use and also the other big decisions about public investments in their neighborhoods and communities, preserving that and expanding that is really the vision in the code. So it was a, a great question. Um, I always say land use is everything. Like land use just is everything. So how Seattle was operating was under these 13 district councils, the city, um, each department, including our planning department, would go to those bodies and pr make their presentation and solicit feedback. So they um, had an advisory body, but they provided their thoughts um, and feedback of, of, around various projects. With the pivot that we made, those 13 district councils, or those who are um, choosing to continue to meet, still have access to that information, but we as a city um, now push that information out to even broader, a broader audience. And we specifically go out to groups who are impacted by potential decisions that might not know about it. So um, when you say, when you ask if those, if those neighborhood associations still get to weigh in, you betcha, and they do. Um, but we now are encouraging more people to weigh in because um, those types of decisions impact so many people. We had a three year plus conversation about affordable housing in Seattle. Um, so we went to district councils, we went to community councils, we went to business associations, we knocked on people's doors and had conversation on porches. Um, so land use very much is our decisions that the community weighs in on and shapes. Hi, thank you. Yes, hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Michelle DePass, I'm a city club member. Um, I also work for the City of Portland Housing Bureau um, in community engagement. Um, Director Ree, thank you uh, for this uh, deep work you're doing. I'm uh, very appreciative, uh, appreciative and can't wait to learn more. And Kathy, I have a uh, question for you that has to do with um, our particular city and the way that we, uh, we operate in a white dominant culture that uh, values uh, return on investment, um, wants charts and, and you know, written documentation, um, values the linear and the individual over the collective. And um, my question for you is, how can we get decision makers to value the, um, the power of communities, um, the benefit of working for those who are most impacted by city decisions, and um, what tools can we use to employ, what, what tools are, have you used in Seattle to employ um, getting those decisions across, those, those practices across the de decision makers? Yeah, I think you guys are already doing so much down here, um, which is fabulous and I applaud and support in any way I can. Um, one of the things that we um, in Seattle were really mindful of is how we presented information to community. So an old meeting about um, anything land use and housing specifically was you would walk into um, like the basement of a, a community center and you'd have a bunch of easels with big boards um, and renderings and they, you know, the city staff, and I was one of them, would give you dots to show which preference you preferred. but. The audience wasn't city planners. They weren't. They were just people. So it was just like we were expecting people to walk in the in the door, having the education and the knowledge to have a really um, a really specific conversation about what was being proposed. So one of the things that we really stressed was how to communicate differently. And I always say it's people speak. So I would have city departments come into me and make the pitch, and I'd, be, I'd raise my hand in the first sentence, and I have no idea what that acronym is. So we really coach people um, how to communicate as people instead of as planners, and how we kept it relatable instead of wonky, because we could get wonky really easily because that's our job and that's the world we live in um, but we shouldn't expect people to understand it and be able to interpret it like that's our job as i said everyone has a voice and it's our job to listen and the message and the messenger are just as important um, so that'd be my one big thing is like remember people speak people speak is the speak that we need to really pay attention to so thanks for your question 
I'm going to take a, a couple of questions from the audience. And I also want to reflect that this is a larger pile of question cards than I have ever seen coming from the City Club audience. And the questions are a broad range of questions from really nitty gritty important questions about code change itself to questions about our values as a city. It's so heartening to see that the level of passion and interest that is in our city around these changes. And I'm sure that means a lot to you as well. I picked out three questions that kind of talk to each other, and I'm going to ask for your reflections on them. I'll, I'll read them one at a time. The first question is, doesn't democracy start at the neighborhood level? Are enough people showing up for the neighborhood association meetings? The second question is, how would civic life support African American communities and organizations when neighborhood association activities are in violation to citizens' rights and do not uphold values spoken about here today. This includes intentional barriers and exclusionary activities to thwart African American participation to serve. And the third question is, if you believe, this is to you, Suk, if you believe in using existing structures to meet people's needs, why do you not want to use neighborhood associations? I know there's a lot in those three questions. Um, the question about why do you not want to use, uh, I don't know what TV, sh uh, what it was, but you know there's that um, kind of joke um, that a lawyer asked you when, did you, when did you stop beating your wife? Right? It's a trap. That's not a false, it's not a real question, right? So, because none of it is true. Um, we don't want to lose or, um, or offend or uh, push out neighborhood associations. P neighborhood associations will continue to be part of the circle of engagement. The real message is, is there's a circle. There's, um, and there's no center. And then maybe that's a little bit different. But we do want to use existing structures, neighborhood associations among them. But I'm reflecting, um, I'm gonna make this quick too. When Carl talked about how the city funded loyal opposition, so I wanna focus back on what has been the city's role in lifting up one form maybe over others, right? And so I was thinking, oh, I wonder why the city didn't also fund uh, the students who were uh, protesting to stop a war or the others who were filling the streets to save a planet or maybe to fight for their rights as women or LGBTQ, or why not the city fund the Black Panthers who are also here, right? Why are they not the loyal opposition? Because they're saying the same things. We want a better country, a better city, and they have something to contribute. So, um, so yes, neighborhood associations. If someone tells you that I or we do not want neighborhood associations in the city of Portland, they're not being truthful. And, um, and I want you to know, I don't lie. And then secondarily, but it is going to be a circle of engagement because we need all of us, all of us, uh, and not just some over others. And that is not government's role to ch pick winners and losers. Can I Jump add to in. this? Um, I think it's really important to remember, and I, I still, like in my years at Seattle, would raise my hand and be the rain cloud. Um, neighborhood associations are important. And um, they're reflective of a community that has the ability to mobilize. Um, there are so many communities that don't have organizations or don't have the capacity or knowledge to mobilize and interact with the city. And that's where, at least um, when I was in Seattle, that's where we wanted to spend more time and energy is because when we start a statement saying, you know, we're going to go out and talk to community groups. Um, we're filtering p communities that don't have groups. So we wanted to like push back the starting line so more people had a chance to have access and to have um, impact on the decisions being made. So I just, because um, I'm neighborhood associations aren't going anywhere. And, and I assume we're not asking them to go anywhere. They're at the table and they'll remain at the table. And again, an important voice, but not the only voice. My two cents. We have more questions than we have time for today for our radio audience, but I'm sure that our panelists will be happy to take questions afterwards. Our time is up and we'll have to pause the conversation for now. We're grateful to everyone who made today's forum possible. Thank you to Carl, Kathy, Sook, and Caitlin for helping us understand the context around these potential changes. Thank you to the Oregon Department of Transportation for sponsoring today's forum. 
Thank you to Mary Margaret Wheeler Weber and Julio Castilla for co producing today's program. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We're adjourned. One of the first words you should say in a speech, and one of the last words you should say in a speech. Now tomorrow, I don't know how many of you are speaking, but I guarantee if you go to conferences, 19 out of 20 speakers will start in one of these ways. Number one, uh, my name is Connor Neal, I'm from Tango, and this talk is about the latest trend in monitoring strategies. Now all of you are sitting with a piece of paper in front of you that says I'm Connor Neal, I've come from Ireland and I'm going to talk about Tango 04 and this. So by repeating what you already know, I'm giving a signal that it's a time to get your Blackberry out. I've just signaled that this talk is opportunity to reconnect with Blackberry, make sure the office is okay, maybe get some plans together for the weekend.